How do I get out of debt? How do I raise my credit What's score? What's this APR stand for? I get my score drop. Who has the What's the FICO score? How, How do, do I credit? How do I credit? credit? Uh, You guys, you know what? Brittany and I are back for another episode of I Can't Even Credit. And today is an interesting topic that we're going to talk about. And I think the tweet, you know, says it all from our guest. And his tweet was, I just quit my job, y'all. And honestly, I needed that for my mental health. So that's deep. A, it's like, oh my gosh, first of all, you just quit your job. And then also, you know, to show the vulnerability of talking about mental health as well, too, and making a decision, you know, acting on that. So I'm excited to, to you know, talk to him and get the lowdown on what was going on in his life at this moment, how he prepared for this moment, and what is he going to do if he's not working right now? I was like, what's, what's, what's going on? So we're going to chat with him. Welcome again to I Can't Even Credit. Again, my name is Carrie and of my lovely co-host, Brittany. Say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. And we have Rakim Sabri on the on, on the line, on the, not on the line with us. He's, he's here with us. I mean, we're all virtual, you know, here, but we can see his face. And if you're watching YouTube, you can see his face as well, too. Um, but welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Okay. So, Brittany, let's get down to business with this. So, because I, I just want to know everything, what was going on. So, this tweet goes out. You decided to put this tweet out. This was what? This was... Um, and, on a Friday, was it? Um, and everybody was like shook. It went viral. Everyone's like, "What are you talking about?" I even retweeted it, and I was like, "I need to know about this." I was like, "What? <laughs> what, what? What is going on?" Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So tell us, like, what was going on that led up to this moment in your life? Yeah. So um, I was coming off of. I actually just hit ten years this year of being in the banking industry. I started a banking career at 21 years old as a part-time teller. And then uh, since then, just rapid growth across two different companies, one large national bank and another smaller regional bank. And uh, probably around February of this year, I started to really get to my wits end. And I knew that entrepreneurship was a goal of mine for a very long time, but I didn't know that entrepreneurship was going to be like it this year. Um, But as time passed, I just it became a little bit more difficult to navigate the space. Um, You know, corporate has a reputation for being pretty rough. Um, And so, you know, there's multiple variables, I think, layered variables here when it comes to ultimately what landed me with leaving. Right. There is the fact that I am a millennial. There is the fact that I am a black man. And there's the fact that, um, you know, mental health at, at the end of it. Um, And I think that's the most important part. And I'm sure we'll get into this more in depth as the conversation unfolds. But what I've found in a lot of the uh, feedback that I've gotten relating to leaving is that there are so many people who want to be in the position that I'm in, despite the fact that there is so much uncertainty and fear relating to walking away from what is security, right? Um, I walked away from close to six figure salary um high performer never got written up never got um you know never did not receive a bonus i got a raise every year um on paper i was like your happy engaged employee but i think that's the that's the toxicity of corporate america you have to kind of wear a face that um that may not be a true face of yours and so um you know really simply i think I was starting to not like who I was becoming. I was starting to not like how I felt when I clocked in. And, um, you know, I started to feel an aspect of um, a fakeness, for lack of a better word, start to take over me. And I was like, right. nah, this is not it. <laughs> like, I want to be me. I want to be free. And fortunately, I had things happening for me on the side. Um, I had a brand that I had been building for years uh, that spoke to different accomplishments that were not um, attached to my corporate identity. And so um, I use the word liberating a lot when I talked about leaving, um, liberating myself from kind of like the shackles of corporate America, if you will, um, allowed for me to fully step into what it is that I built. Um, without having to ask permission or fear fear or feel fear 
or feel anxiety or guilt about the things that I was sharing or um, mm -hmm. feel like I had to be questioned about oh. anything. And then, and so you, you would, and you just were about to make 10 years. I mean, that's, that's where we were, you and I definitely, you know, relate because, because I, I came from the making industry as well before, you know, Experian and I worked for 11 years. Um, so I can definitely understand, I think just the security in general, you know, when you're working, you know, typically in corporate America, you're thinking, okay, you know, nothing's maybe going to happen to me. Maybe even if there's some, some kind of changes internally, usually I can get propped up and put somewhere else. You know what I mean? The company yeah. is so huge. So there's always kind of places for you to go, places for you to grow typically, usually, you know, in that. And so I can see where you kind of get on this train right. of, um, of, you know, just, just kind of going. And even if you're not feeling a hundred percent, you know what I mean? Like you like, I'm still there. I still need to be able to live. I still need to be able to eat. I still need to be able to afford my lifestyle so I can somewhat put up with it, even if I'm not, you know, hundred percent happy. But I think there's definitely a point probably that you got to where it's like, it's like almost like a breaking point where, you know what I mean? Things are can maybe because because what if let's say for instance you would have stayed then maybe what have you got written up in the future you know what i mean like would your behavior change something where you just couldn't even control it because it's like you're you're starting to really be unhappy where it can show on the outside you know with it and so um or whatever mental health you know issues that could have it could have created if you would have stayed on so that's that that's huge um and then maybe you end up leaving not on the terms that you wanted to leave you know maybe something gets ha happens and you get fired or something and then you're like oh crap i wasn't prepared for that so and i think that was that was a, a part of it too so uh the company that i had worked for just came out of um massive layoffs so i think there were like 200 layoffs that we were made aware of and then there was a merger that was taking place um so it was like okay let's lean out so that we can look good so that we yeah. can get you know other things on our books you understand yeah, like the whole politics difficult. behind it and there was a lot of uncertainty in my particular role um in terms of you know whether or not it was going to look and feel the way that i had grown accustomed to it being um but more than that whether or not it was even going to exist in the future so um what you said was really spot on in terms of the decision making process leading up to it Whereas I was um, advised by many people to stay on until I got fired so that I can collect unemployment or what have you. I wanted to make that decision on my own terms. And say, you know what? I want to go out on top. I build a solid brand of being a high performer here. If there is any introspection that takes place um, from a leadership perspective around why somebody who was high performing, um, who was, you know, making the salary that I was making, who was engaged in the way that I was engaged in activities, why would this person leave without notice just randomly, right? So then I, can, I think it kind of forces an internal dialogue. And of course, I'm not around to hear what that sounds like, but um, I wanted to make sure that there was no way the narrative can be um, warped or misrepresented to say, oh, well, you know, it's in the middle of a pandemic. He had a mental breakdown. He stopped performing. He stopped being engaged. We had to sever ties for, you know, whatever myriad of political reasons they can yeah. pull. So how long did it, like, actually finally take you? I mean, you, you're, this buildup, your burnout, you're not loving who you are. How long did it actually take you to finally say, that's it, I'm done, I want to leave? Like, what, what was that process? Was it over a couple years? Was it a month? Was it a day you woke up and you're just like, today's the day I am done. I am done. <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, I think the two weeks leading up to me quitting was the most kind of impactful. Um, I, I was simultaneously getting more and more burnt out as the days turned, but I was also receiving um, huge compliments from people outside of my place of employment. Right, people telling me how talented I am, how visionary I am. You know, speaking specifically to like the entrepreneurial stuff that I had going on on the side people trying to recruit me and I was just like wait a second all of these people see this talent I need to do something about this right like I can I can pretend and I said this to somebody I said I can pretend to be engaged in working for your company for the next two years and the whole while be looking for an exit strategy or I can focus on what I have going on feel fulfilled and you know build it out if i if i fail then at least i tried and um i have a really strong support system and you know we talked through i mean i've had multiple multiple conversations we've talked through 
the pros and cons of me sticking around. And um, ultimately, I don't think anybody specifically advised me to quit because at that point, it just kind of seemed like the irresponsible thing to do. But when we started taking inventory of, okay, what is it that I've built up in terms of assets? Like, how am I going to be able to cover this time period? What is my plan going to be? How am I going to generate income or how am I going to leverage what it is that I've accomplished in the past? Then it started to make more sense. And I said, wait a second, I can actually do this. And so that's where um, I want to say definitely the, the two weeks leading up to wow. it was, was paramount. So that means, because I mean, yeah, the first thing in my head, I, you know, you, you were talking through all of this and thinking, wow, when you, you know, you could actually, you know, do this. I mean, the number one for me would be, you know, what, from a financial perspective, where am I at? And I know we talk a lot about, you know, of having like budgets and spending and emergency funds. Emergency funds are like huge. You know what I mean? Everyone talks about emergency funds all the time, maybe three months, six months, a year, you know, maybe of, of having it. And so I think sometimes it's like people build those funds and thinking for the unexpected to happen. And maybe it's, you know, some kind of crazy and expense, you know, and it happens in your life. But then it can also be in this moment. You know what I mean? Where it's like you, it's not even unexpected. It's kind of more of like, I have to make this life change. I have to, to make, you know, this sacrifice or do this in order for me to, you know, still, you know, live happily. And now I have, I can utilize this resource to maybe, you know, help me to stay afloat while I'm, you know, in my transition period or, or working things out. So, so, I mean, so did you just pretty much have you always been good with like your money and finances? I mean, like working, you know, in that space, um, or was it something where it's like, okay, well, I think maybe this is going to be my future down the road. So I should, I should probably build this little nest egg right now, you know, and thinking like, okay, it's, it's time I have enough. And I'm feeling like this is the time to flip that switch and leave. I think it's kind of a combination of both for sure. Um, so I, I've branded myself as like a financial I won't call myself an expert, but definitely a financial enthusiast, uh, personal finance enthusiast. So I did a TED talk on uh, financial empowerment. I wrote a book on financial empowerment. Um, most of the work that I do with um, you know, publications or any brands is around financial education. So um, I've had to learn that manually. I think there is a misconception that people who work in the space automatically like get this download of expertise. So true. Um <laughs> we talk about that all the time. We're like Brittany and I were like, please, just because we work here, we started doesn't mean that we've been on top of it forever. And the first episode of this podcast even talks about me and my own journey when I was working for a bank. I know. <laughs> and, I'm and like, yeah, so <laughs> So, um, so it, it definitely kind of comes with the territory, right? Like this is the the proof of concept when it comes to, okay, well, Rakim's out there preaching about financial education and financial empowerment. Well, let's see, does he actually walk the walk? And, you know, I feel fortunate in, in being able to say that, you know, everything that I preach, quote unquote, um, I live, I don't um, preach from a YouTube kind of pulpit and say, hey, this is what I read about and this is what you guys should do. Um, it, it, I've... I'm a very firm believer practitioner um, in the idea of paying yourself first. Um, when it came to emergency fund, I didn't have a static like savings account. I invested everything. I invested as much of my disposable income as I could. And so um, that's seen some serious gains over time. And then on the credit side of things, I've built up you know decent credit limits that would allow for me to, in the event of emergency, really kind of leverage that credit in a way that was advantageous for me. That's great. Wow. Yeah, so he was ready. Yeah, I'm like, a lot of people, when they just want to quit their jobs, they're like, well, I can't really. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, uh, I need my paycheck. <laughs> no, exactly, I mean, like he said it, he said there's, there's a lot of people that are probably, that were in his position that he was in, that felt this exact same way, but yeah. how many people could say, financially, I can do this. I can walk away from, you know, an employee that's giving me a paycheck every two weeks or whatever it is for me to be able to live um, and to be like, I, I, I can't do it anymore. I mean, and I'm sure maybe there's pe been people that have, have made this decision or this has happened to them um, that, were, that weren't financially ready. And then now it's like a struggle, you know what I mean, afterwards, but then they had to get out of that situation. So you never know, you know, this is someone's circumstance, but... But ideally, you know, you would want to be set up the way that, right. that you were. So that's great that you were already, you know, set up. Because I think a lot of people could, or aren't, wouldn't, wouldn't be in the same position. You know what I mean? And I don't want to misrepresent, too, like, what ready looks mm -hmm. like or even what, um, 
what capable looks like, right? Like I, so in a perfect world, I would not touch my investment assets, right? I would want to keep them where they're at and let them continue to grow. Um, but you know, the differentiating factor between, you know, what is this, a uh, rally call around financial literacy and what is financial empowerment is saying, you know, to your point, Kerry, um, I have an emergency fund, not just for the, you know, car breaking down in the middle of the road emergency or the flood that occurs in my house emergency. I have an emergency fund that says my mental health or my physical health matters. And so I'm going to lean on that in that instance. And so I think the biggest um, emotion outside of fear going into this decision was the empowerment piece like feeling like okay i made a decision for me and i feel empowered in that decision because of everything that i've done and practiced leading up to this point to say i can do this it, it wasn't a want but it was just i felt like it got to a point where it became right. a need right so now that you've you know made this transition no longer working we saw the tweet i retweeted the tweet <laughs> you know, everyone was, was probably all, you know, asking questions like, how, you know, how did you do this? Like, what's going on? Like, what's so like, do you think things have I mean, yes, it's like a, I want to know, like, what's next on, on on your agenda. But then also even financially, have you seen any sort of shift um, in the way that you spend or save now that you're not going, you know, to that job any longer now that you haven't. And so has things changed for you or are you, are you pretty much thinking you can just pretty much stay the same that you were always doing and you, you know, just keep, keep, keep writing out there. Uh, things have definitely changed. I think more so from uh, being conscious of what spending looks like. So I'm still spending for sure. And every time I spend, I have to say, well, you know, there's not going to be a check coming in two weeks. So, you know, that's something to be mindful of. Um, but then also too, like knowing how to leverage emergency services, right? You can call the financial, um, obligations that you have and say, Hey, look, like I'm out of a job. This is a situation. I need a little bit of help. And so, and so knowing that you can ask for help, I think is important. Now, I haven't initiated any of this yet, but, um, it's definitely something that's in within the scope of what my plan is. Um, I'm not saving at all because there's no money coming in right now. And so really it's, um, so this will be week three that I'm out. Um, and the last two weeks have really been focused on relaxation and decompressing. So finding out, and I've been using this analogy um, every time I talk about it. I grew up in corporate. You know, I, I said I started in 21. I started at 21 um, and I just turned 31 this year. So, you know, you think about how impressionable those years are when it comes to development and who you actually are. And I realized that corporate culture shaped a lot of, you know, how I moved, how I talked, what I wore, where I went. Like, there was a lot um, in terms of, like, obligations and the things that I would tolerate that maybe I didn't want to tolerate. But I felt like, well, this is the best thing from a posturing perspective. And so really getting comfortable with figuring out who I am, um, but more importantly, who it is that I want to be outside of that identity has been important for me in this in this journey. Um, and so I've been I've been very reflective. I've been reading. I've been writing. Um, I've been scheduling time to do nothing um, and then really take an inventory of the amount of time that I have available now. Like I don't have to ask permission to take a day off. I don't have to ask permission to go on vacation. I don't have to ask permission for anything. I can do what I want when I want. Um, and so again, that's a liberating feeling, but it's also a scary feeling. And I'll be, you know, very transparent this weekend, um, specifically was very emotional for me. Like it was just kind of like, all right, I need to figure this out. Um, yes, I'm in a position financially where I can kind of ride it out. But I, like I said, I don't want to deplete what it is that I have. I would like to really focus on generating income instead of living off of my savings. And um, what I've settled on is that everything will be okay. I need to trust this process. Um, and what I found, if I pay attention, is that opportunities are abundant opportunities like keep rolling out to me based off of the work that I've put in right I have a book that I can point to I have a TED talk that I can point to I write for entrepreneur um, I do so much that I can leverage the brand that I've built to do more 
And so that for me is just kind of like, don't panic. It's okay. Like this is this is a feeling. You know, you have to figure it out, but you will figure it out. Exactly. If you weren't ready, you have to remember the reasons why you quit in the first place. I love that you're taking care of yourself first because I feel like a lot of people just put that to the to the side. You know, I need the check every two weeks. I have a family. I have this. I have that. But um, really, taking care of yourself is. I mean, it's hard, it's scary, but I think you obviously did the right thing. You seem really happy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, definitely. I, I am, but you know, I think the thing that, that gives me so much fulfillment in this um, beyond like the personal gratification and, um, and being able to kind of explore myself in a different way is the community that has been kind of rallying behind me from a social media perspective. And even, you know, within my own family and friend circles, um, there are people who reach out to me regularly. that like, how are you doing today? Like, how's your mind? How are you feeling? What are you working on? What's your plan? How can I help? But um, social media, I mean, it, it's a beast of a thing. And, and depending on how you use it, um, it, it kind of goes both ways, right? Like you can gain inspiration from watching other people, but you can certainly inspire people. And so many people have reached out to me and like shared with me that they either were in my situation and that they've been, you know, free from employment um, in a traditional sense for X amount of time or they'd like to be where I am. And so they're trying to figure out what that looks like. And um, I'm somebody who likes to kind of like catch that momentum, bottle it up and, and, you know, do something with it. Right. So I've been asked probably a handful of times now to write a book about my experience in corporate so that's something that i'm considering um i've been asked to start a podcast i've been asked to start a youtube so i'm just kind of figuring out the angles that i want to kind of fire off from that says okay this was my process this is what led up to um me getting here now and everybody loves like that success story right you leave corporate america you go out you become your own boss and then you're out there living. And so um, rather than being at the point of, okay, I've arrived, this is my story. I okay. think a lot of people yeah. um, enjoy being a part of the story. They like to see what that progression looks like. And so um, it's a very raw kind of experience for me because I'm being very transparent. I'm being very vulnerable. I'm showing off you know, everything that I have, but people are reacting to that they're engaging with that and, and that engagement is so like well because I you're finally like being genuine right media, you're being right? Like, your you genuine to, self to not that, you, so. that persona that you had to put on every day at the bank this person that you didn't like to become now you're finally being yourself and people are i mean when people sense the vulnerability and just the genuine person behind the post i mean viral goes viral right i mean yeah. you can't make this stuff up and you can pay for posts all day long, but the, the yeah. person who's sharing their real story and it's their raw emotions and everything is the is the the people who get the viral posts, right? Yeah, so. that's that's one hundred percent. It's one. Yeah, it definitely is. And, and 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 I know we pride ourselves. You know, I think this is that's kind of like what you were talking about was was hitting me because it was just like the whole reason why we wanted to even have a podcast like this because just like opening up and, and, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to be vulnerable and it's hard to be, you know, especially in the sense when you're talking about your own personal finances and then, you know, because, because people associate money, you know, with, with, with power, you know, and status. And so if they're thinking like, oh, you're in this situation, like, oh my gosh, like, you know, how is this? And, you know, and, and you're sharing this, um, you just never know what someone else can be going through and then how you can inspire someone else or, you know, or even, you know, or even how inspiring even to yourself just by even sharing that and, and, and you know, putting it in perspective, thinking like, okay, so I'm here, like, you know what I mean? And now I'm in this mode to figure out like, what are my next steps? Like, you know, what, what, what am I doing? And so, so yeah, I, I think it's, I love life experiences like that. Um, you know, where it's kind of like, this is a big challenge and I'm kind of scared and fearful, but then it's always great to know that you're going to end up, you know, on the other side of it. And it's like, damn, that, that was great. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I did that, um, you know, and so that's, and it's always a plus. And, and like I said, yeah, you, you just never know like who you're, you're going to expire and, you know, inspire out there as well too. But, um, yeah, that's, that's, I love that you said, um, people associate money with power and like success. I really, I agree. Like that is a, like that is kind of problematic. Right. But, um, mm -hmm. 
for me, when I see somebody who's truly happy in what they're doing, that to me is like, wow, they have it made. Like they yeah. are killing it. That That is success to me. Because maybe they're making half of what they were making, but they are glowing. They are shining. They are inspiring people every single day and doing what they love. So I just love your story. Um, what would you What would you tell somebody who is stuck in the corporate job, has a little side hustles, maybe on the edge, thinking like kind of the same kind of the same boat as you? Is there any advice that you would give that person who's just maybe too scared to to invest in themselves or uh, take that leap of faith? Uh, I mean, there's a million things I could say, I, but I think, I think some of the, uh, off the top of my head, some of the important things are definitely, um, leverage your support system. You know, I, I could not have made this decision if I didn't have those countless conversations with people who believed in me. Like they just, I mean, one person said to me, you have, uh, too great of a network to fail. Like nobody is going to let you fail. And I was just like, wow, like that's impactful. Um, financially, um, you know, going back to this idea that money equals power, um, I think to a degree that it's true, but probably not in the way that most people interpret it. Right. Um, there's a difference between having six figures and making six figures. Right. Um, and I'm just using that as a round number. There's a lot of people who aspire to, you know, make the six figure mark, but to your point, you can do what you're passionate about, make much less, and still grow your balances. It's it's a matter of discipline. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of you know deciding that that's for you. Um, and so the the corporate employee who has a side hustle has a leg up, I think, on a lot of people who are just dependent on one stream of income. Right? They can use that side hustle income to pay down debt or to invest or to, you know, reinvest in their business. And, um, I mean, the fear, the fear is always going to be there. I, I, that's something that I've really been examining because it's a dominant, one of the dominant emotions that I've experienced. Um, but you learn how to use fear as an ally instead of allowing it to paralyze you, um, and saying, okay, this fear is making, you know, the adrenaline run through your body and it's making your heart beat faster and it's making you think, about all of the possibilities, that's an advantage because now you can go in and say, okay, I know that this is a possibility, that's a possibility, that's a possibility. What angle do I want to take? And then I need to do this with some urgency. I think comfort allows for us to kind of move very slowly, um, sometimes not at all because we're just like, well, I can show up to work and give 50% tomorrow and I'll still get my full paycheck. Um, and I started to feel comfortable and, um, and I didn't like that. I wanted to, you know, mediocrity for me wasn't an option. Um, I, I wanted to do things. I wanted to build things. I wanted to grow. And, um, I'm just going to add this last point because I think it's so important to say there is like this narrative, um, especially in social media spaces where we talk about entrepreneurship that, glorifies entrepreneurship over nine to five employee. Um, and, and it really, it's not one or the other. It's what works for you. Like there are people who will forever be happy working in nine to five and that's completely okay. And then there's people who are just like, you know what? Like, this is not for me. It's never been for me. I can't do it anymore. And that's okay too. Um, it's about what you want as an individual and what it is that you're willing to put in to make that thing successful. Um, I mean, there's people who I know who work in corporate who make multiples of what it was that I was making, um, but don't quite have as much saved up as I have saved up, right? So it's just like that financial education piece is so important. Um, and knowing like what you want specifically for Absolutely. you Those is are, so that's important. Great too. tips. That's so it's super inspiring, you know, definitely. And, and yeah, I, I, I hope that, you know, someone out there that maybe, you know, hears this and thinking like, hey, you know, like, is this something that, that, that I, I can do? Can I make this move, you know, um, this life changing move financially? Am I ready mentally? You know, can I can I do this right? And do I need to do this, you know, right now? And and just knowing and 
And I also love that the point that that you make because I was thinking about you know other kind of like tips and that we would you know typically give someone when we're talking about the situations like this. And I think one of the ones I think you, you had touched on earlier was about. Um, is you is reaching out to your lenders like a lot of times I think people wait for the last minute when they're already you know in a past due situation 60 days or whatever but not knowing that you can maybe reach out to them when it's like before that mark even happens to say like hey this is my situation right now are there any programs for me maybe they have some kind of financial relief program maybe they can they can like reamortize your loan out differently or something but I think people always kind of forget that you know that the lender is there and they also want to be able to make sure that, that, that they get their money back that they've you know given out to you. So if you're reaching out to them, there's could be a possibility that they have some kind of program, something to help you out in your situation. If your financial situation has definitely changed, but you just have to make the outbound call. It's not instead of waiting for them to call you when the collections calling to say you didn't you should have told us nine months ago that you couldn't pay this. You know what I mean? Or something was, or your job situation changed or, you know, whatever it is. So. So yeah, I think it's a great part um, to, to to do that and and build that emergency fund. There's not one size that fits all. Obviously, maybe some people just need three months, six months, whatever it is. But whatever you need to feel, you know, to feel secure or whatever it is, you know, for it, then so be it. Um, there. So yeah, yeah that's. I think too, it's, like it's really great. What you were saying kind of hit me too because you know I've walked people through situations like that where it's like oh they're past due 30 days 60 days 90 days now they have these remarks on their credit report and you know credit the world of credit I think this is so appropriate for this conversation the world of credit is really what opened me up to financial education it's understanding you know what makes up a credit score and all of those things and you know I've hit 800 plus credit score before and I'm very close to that right now right like five points away uh, last time I checked in, so it's like Experience that was boost. one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Right? I had to. Experience boost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> and um, and you know that was something that I was conscious of too. Like, man, like I worked so hard to get my credit to where it is, like stellar mm -hmm. credit. There was a point in time that I didn't know that an 800 credit score existed. And am I gonna put myself in a situation where I can, you know, damage that? Like knowing all of the benefits that come with that kind of a credit mm -hmm. score. Um, and so, like you said, being ahead of it is so important, like before you become past due or late or anything like that. Absolutely. Especially right now, there's so many options because of the pandemic and there's a lot more forgiveness in programs and programs and things that uh, resources to help um, during these unprecedented times. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've never been through anything like this. So especially call those lenders because there's definitely programs out there. Yeah, definitely. Well, this was a great, a so great, good. inspiring talk. Rakim, let everyone know where they can find you out, you know, any websites, social media, anything. If you guys want to check out that tweet, you can find them on Twitter. <laughs> definitely, too. But get, share share all the, the uh, socials and everything for you. So um, all of my socials are my name. That's Rakim Sabri, R-A-H-K-I-M-S-A-B-R-E-E. -E. Uh, my website is also my name, RakimSabri.com. And, uh, you know, a lot of my work is floating around out there. Um, actually, if you type my name in the Google, some stuff will come up, too. So um, that's that's and it in the books. nutshell. Check out the books. Yeah. The books, Financially Irresponsible, uh, published in 2019. Uh, Mentorship, the Playbook, published in 2018. And stay on the lookout for whatever comes out about this corporate experience probably by the end of this year beginning that of next year we better get a signed copy, copy. i know i was like i want a signed copy of that <laughs> yes i 100 will oh send you guys I'm all we're not box. desperate at all <laughs> like i need a signed copy <laughs> awesome awesome Brittany, let them know where where they can find us on social and all the financial education i mean everything we're talking about here about financial literacy and learning about things like we try to do that that kind of content you know in social all the time to help people out so where can they find us Yes, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Experian. Um, and then Twitter is at Experian underscore US. And follow us, like us, comment, all the things. Um, oh, it's Carrie and I back there. So all of your comments go to us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All the comments, all the feedback. We love it. Go on Apple Podcasts. Give us that five star rating and share some feedback there as well, too. And 
Thanks for checking us out on YouTube as well for everybody that's watching the video. If you're listening to the audio version, if you want to see our faces, you can head over to Experience YouTube channel and find the I Can't Even Credit podcast there. But thanks again for you guys for joining us today and another great episode and super inspiring as always. And have a good one, guys. Take care. 